Hey, praise the Lord. I got the camera working. Now that's a miracle. <laughs> oh, so many things go on. You know, life is an interesting set of circumstances that seem to be strung together with the element of time holding all things into a compartmentalized segment. So that way God could have it from the beginning, the middle, and the end, your life, as it were, the way that you lived it out, thinking that there's something that's called yesterday and that there's something called tomorrow. But reality is there's only really today. You have no idea if you're going to live tomorrow and you have no idea how to get to the past. So all there is is now. And I like that because God operates in the eternal now. Well, speaking of now, <laughs> now that we brought that up, it's been interesting is that I should mention something because now is right around Halloween and now is not what you think it is. You know, a time that I'm going to bust your chops about Halloween and harvest parties and all the other made up ideas that people have to compromise somehow to make it work for our kids and our church and the adults. Hmm. It's kind of interesting the fact that they have to compromise to make Halloween fit Christianity today. Because you see, the way we got Halloween was by Christians trying to change Bacchalia into a Christian holiday and we came up with Halloween. You know, All Souls Day, All Saints Day. So now, 200 or maybe a couple thousand years later, over a thousand years, I guess, about a thousand years, we have the problem of making the made-up holiday fit Christian ways because we already tried it once, so we're going to try it again to make it right so people could enjoy it without feeling guilty about really compromising. And that makes sense? Okay. Now let's be real. This is a candy corn. I like the way it tastes. That, that, that's what I'm chewing. There's another one in there too. Here's some more. And some more. I like candy corn. Ah! And I'm going to be wild and fine and all over the place. From the sugar. And that's the consequence of candy corn. Or, in this case, too much candy corn. But I like it. I can burn up most of that sugar. What I can't, I got water for it. And somehow, candy corn makes water taste sweeter. Think about that one. <laughs> well, I'm not going to bust your chops on Halloween, because what you do with it is your choice. It's not going to send you to hell any more than me. This candy corn's going to send me to hell any more than the... Uh, health Nazis are going to talk me into eating kosher. Now, if I choose to eat kosher, which I have in the past, for about two years, you know, and I give up meat, you know, and a bunch of things, you know, and I tried it, and it was like, eh, you know, it was good. I liked it. But once I got back to Pepsi, man, where is my Pepsi? Oh, well, we'll get it later. But I choose to drink Pepsi, not because it's going to kill me, which some people think, although it kept me alive with Crohn's, but because I want to, I choose to, and I know the consequences of it, so I do. God takes care of what might be the negative aspects of it. If he allows that to tell me some point in time, don't drink Pepsi, then I'll quit drinking Pepsi. If he allows me to drink Pepsi, I'll drink Pepsi. That's what it is about Halloween. You know, if you want to lie about it, you can call it a harvest party or call it a biblical fall feast or whatever you're going to call it. But because you're doing it at the same time as Halloween, let's be real. You know what you're doing. Compromising. And that's okay. 
Because you see, on that day, it's also Reformation Day. You know, when they celebrate Luther and all the other things going on. But you didn't know that. Besides, you don't like to remember that it's a Christian holiday from the Protestant side. Because you don't like to remember that it's a Christian holiday from the Catholic side. The only thing you can remember is it's a dress-up day for candy. So modern evangelicals, because they don't want to be called Protestants, they don't want to be called Catholics, and they sure don't want to be pagans, they call it biblical. Wait. I don't know about you, but something stinks. <laughs> and frankly, Calvary chapels are famous for it. Other churches are doing it. A lot of people are choosing it. And here in Utah, it's unbelievable to me, but much as I can't understand how and why, the Mormons are too. Matter of fact, they're into the haunted house. Now, I find that interesting. Haunted house. You know, they're okay to deal with haunted houses, but, you know, just saying, hey, that's Utah. And frankly, Mormons all around the world, for some reason, they get away with doing haunted houses. I mean, there must be some money in it somewhere. I don't understand it. But I'm not busting your chops. No, 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 no. In reality, what I'm telling you is, you can do it. And it won't kill you. But what will kill you is lying about it. And to yourself, lying, but lying to your children. You already know it's about Halloween. And I mean, if you just went ahead and admitted all of the history of it, instead of trying to convert it, like the way they're trying to convert Christian history of America into the history of America, that scares the bejeebies out of me. I'm a history major. I know all our founding fathers weren't Christian. Some were deists, and deists are not quote-unquote, today, listed as Christian, they'd be considered cults. So, be careful, Christian. When you're lying, which is what compromise is, then you find yourself in a predicament. A little lie becomes a big lie when you have to explain the little lie, because you make it into a big lie by lying more, and you add to it. So try to tell the truth when you're doing Halloween, this Halloween. I mean, the kids already know. Maybe you just can't admit it because you're the adult. Churches lie. Pastors lie. It's not in the Bible. I mean, of all the holidays that are in there, there's even two fall feasts, maybe three, that Jews do this time of year at the same time that's going on that the Catholics invented one, the Protestants invented one, the Calvary chapels now are inventing one, the evangelicals are inventing them. Man, you'd think the Baptists would have came up with one by now. Or did they? So you see, man often confuses what God has said. God never said to pay attention to these holidays. He said he's got a few holy days he's going to hold you accountable for, but holidays, they don't care. Jesus didn't do Halloween. I mean, that's obvious. Didn't do Christmas either. Or Hanukkah, like some people are trying to make it out to be. Or oh, there was a feast of dedication, but it don't have anything to do with the same thing that people nowadays are calling Hanukkah. That's the problem with business or religion getting involved in, or I should say money and religion. You know, there should be a law about that. Maybe we should write a law in the Constitution. You know how they have the implied idea of the separation between church and state, which really is more about the church won't create a religion, but hey, everybody's creating their own religion nowadays. But we should write a law that says, let's keep the church and state separate, and then let's do one better. Let's keep the church and money separate, and see how far it goes. Because it seems like money corrupts the church, and it seems like the church is corrupted by money. When I watch Christians get involved in politics, I know the state corrupts the church, and the church corrupts the state, because they get power. So power and money, maybe we should avoid those things. 
don't know about you, but I'm thinking this Halloween. I don't need to get dressed up in order to get candy. I sure don't have to go down and do a Bible quiz in order to get candy. Only once a year can I ever find candy corn, though. So I'm buying up and stocking up a whole bunch of this stuff because I want to take it on my trip down to Mississippi. But I like candy. I don't like everything else that's attached to it. That's part of the problem about some of your days that you're playing with. There's a lot of baggage attached to it. And how you deal with the baggage really determines what you're doing or how real you are with your God. Same thing with politics. God doesn't ignore you so that you can go have a political lynch mob. God doesn't ignore you so you can have a political or religious party. God doesn't ignore you at all. God is watching you 24-7. Yep. Just saying. So yeah, if you want to do the Halloween thing, go ahead. Enjoy. Just saying. But God's watching. You can tell yourself that it's okay. I hope for your sake you won't have any consequences. Me, I don't do Halloween. Don't do Harvest. Don't do any of those days. I just do what it is today the Lord has told me to do. And today is a day that I will rejoice and be glad in. So what I wanted to tell you about was how I was rejoicing in having some Christian jump my case again. He wanted to slam everybody that was divorced. I've been divorced more than once. So I just said, well, Lord, I don't like to talk about divorce. God says, i like you to talk about divorce. I said, but I don't like to talk about divorce. God says, I like you to talk about divorce. I said, no, I don't talk about divorce. I said, yeah, you do. I said, oh, fine. Because otherwise, I'm going to be a Jonah and wind up, you know, cast out somewhere, having to talk about it anyways. So this guy was kind of like slamming divorced people and telling, oh, you know, anybody that marries someone that's divorced commits adultery. Because say, well, that's not hard. Every time I turn on a computer, I practically commit adultery. Have you ever seen what's on the computer? <laughs> Come on now, let's be real. If you're a man, you commit adultery almost every day. Be real. Come on, the flesh, ah. You can't tell me that, you know, like I said, there it goes, adultery. At least that's what Jesus said. So, if Jesus said that even looking and thinking is adultery, and you committed the act because of the thought, then if you're committing the act by divorcing and remarriage, causing her to be found in adultery, is the issue adultery or is the issue a matter of the heart? Is it a condition of our relationships? Is it a reality of our learning process of developing better and more qualified decision-making policies and practices so that when we come to that place of what real marriage is, I hate to use the word real, but frankly, I'm a ordained minister, preacher, but they call it minister on the documentation I have. So I'm ordained. Big deal. Who cares? <laughs> but, you know, I've already been, I mean, besides the laying out of hands and everything else, way before I ever got any paperwork. Who cares about the paperwork? But I'm ordained. Now, that means I can marry someone. Of course, that's not such a big deal. If you have a boat and you go out into international waters, you can marry somebody too. It's not a big deal. Captain of a boat can do it. So, captain of a boat and preacher or minister. Hmm. Anyways, I'm certified to marry people in all 50 states, you know. Maybe other places too. But I, knowing what marriage is, probably will never marry anyone because I don't look at the 
capability or ability to marry someone, I look at, am I being culpable for their divorce? Now, you may think this is weird, but it's true. There was a lie going around by this Christian woman who decided to look at statistics and then tried to say that Christian marriages are oh rock solid and they're not, you know, like as bad as the world. They're, as a matter of fact, most Christian marriages are doing well. Only problem was was that she examined statistics from marriage licenses and she didn't look at the legal documentation by the IRS of people who are divorced paying taxes. Interesting. Because you see, on the one hand, she said, well, you know, the Pew Research people who are Christians, you know, they do this research based upon a thousand people and compute it by ten times and then they get up these numbers. And I said, true. That's why I don't go by Pew. She said, well, you know, the church, it examines itself, you know, and does these numbers, and so she's running around selling her book on marriage, you know, and she says, but I've done the research, and this is what I've done. And I said, true. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you examined the divorce rate based upon divorce papers? No. Have you looked at the divorce rate based upon the legal documentation of divorce papers and then compared that to the population? No. Is there a way that you could do that on the computer to write an algorithm to pull up all the legal documentation that has to be in the public domain for at least three days when filing for a divorce? No. So, you've never really looked at public records, have you? No. So, you're the expert on the fact that Christians are claiming their divorce rate is better than the world. Yeah, because I think so. Oh. What can I say? I like doing research. So, I don't want to talk about divorce. I don't want to talk about all these things, but this man decided to slam people that are divorced. So, God bugged me a little bit, so I kind of wrote back to him, because he was using one portion of scripture out of context. And I said, well, so you really should write the rest of it, because I said they were talking about, you know, challenging Jesus, and then also the disciples, by way of Jesus talking about divorce, came up with their own logical conclusion that it's better not to marry. So I mentioned that to him and he got and took exception and said that I was off the wall and I said, I may be off the wall, but that's what the disciples said. I'm just quoting them. <laughs> I mean, I'm not telling anybody to go out there and be a monk. I'm, I, for one, am someone who will not be divorced. In other words, I won't be divorced and I won't be single because better to marry than to burn, like Paul said. And I know what that meant. No problem there. But the problem is, is that people want to beat someone else up to make up what they feel better about once they've done that. Well, we got to push those people aside. We got to stop them from divorcing by hurting them. We got to make them stop what they're doing by beating them or, you know, making it illegal. You know, kind of like abortions, you know. Well, we got to, you know, get rid of all the abortion clinics so that people will stop having abortions. Really? How did they have abortions before, um, can I say, abortion clinics? Well, you take a little bit of arsenic and you take a little bit of water and you start taking little sips of that and it'll make you have a miscarriage. Oh, and when did they have that? The Roman Empire. There's some other, you know, herbs and things that they used to mix in the water, you know, and they just take it as a little medicinal thing. And the women all knew it because the midwives would tell the women how to do this. You know, you can't have an abortion. Ah, no problem. Matter of fact, women can still do that today. Oh. But that's just a miscarriage, right? So you see, sometimes this beating each other up to get each other to do the right thing isn't really the way God 
said to do things. Jesus said that whatsoever a man is, is made obvious by the words of his mouth. In other words, he said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, if you change the heart, you will change the mind. If you change the mind, the actions will change. So, you don't change somebody having an abortion by getting rid of the clinic. They'll still have an abortion. They'll just figure out another way to do it. There'll be a pill or there'll be something else. But you change the heart of the person that is having that feelings of rejection by being abused and used by a man as a object and objectified as just a lustful subject for his own passion and immediate gratification. So really, I mean, if you wanted to go out and castrate the man, that's the answer. It only takes men one castration and they will quit having sex outside of marriage. Now, if a woman castrates a man that's in married, yeah, we might start quit getting married, but you know what I'm saying. Men do. Women don't believe that's true. They don't think that that'll work. I know it will. They do that in the Middle East. Yeah, at least they used to. See, there was a time where in a lot of Muslim tradition, faith was by the actions of the Old Testament law, just like in Deuteronomy and in Levitical law. There was a lot of things that was like what you would say, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. If your right eye offends you, then pluck it out, Jesus said. That's an eye for an eye. Your sin's being committed by your right eye, get rid of it. Well, you know, they help you out a little bit, you know, in some cultures. You know, like if you're a thief and you use your right hand, you have that cut off because your left hand usually was used to wipe, you know, kind of like privately, you know, things. So, in public arenas where you might share a common bowl, if you went to put your hand in there with your left hand, you'd be killed because it was like, that's obscene. That's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. And so, that is one of the things that used to be done about cutting off your hand, and that's why Jesus said, pluck out your eye, because, you know, if it works, do it. But the reality of what the long-term eternal effect is, change your heart, change your mind, change your action. So I was trying to present this to this man, and I was kind of like, you know, worked with him, and that was yesterday, and then today he came back at me, you know, which I already knew he would, because it was like, I don't want people getting beat up because there's more Christians divorced than there are married in any church. I know, I've been to the churches. I talk to people. I just say, hey, I'm divorced, no problem. Oh, well, let me talk to you. You know, how are you doing now? But you know, I mean, everybody wants to make your pastor out to be perfect. Pastor wise, you know, maybe, but some of these pastors, you know, you don't want to talk about how they might have got married, you know, like the interpreter, you know, like they were going overseas as missionaries. How can they marry the interpreter? Okay. Just saying. Humanity is humanity. The fact being, though, knowing that we have so many divorced, God wants to have mercy upon the divorce, not condemnation. So I was trying to tell him and explain to him, you know, how the balance of it is and that you know, it can be forgiven of committing adultery by marrying a divorced person and all these things, you know, and sharing on and on about it, you know, and the guy was just like, no, not me, you know, so I thought, fine. Go your way. I said, first of all, all you got to do is ask Jesus. He'll tell you the truth. He'll tell you exactly what he said before, and then he'll tell you how to apply it. Without the Spirit of God, you're not applying it correctly. If you do have the Spirit of God, then he's going to tell you what Jesus said, and Jesus will speak in by way of the Spirit speaking to you. You'll hear God's voice, literally, by him speaking audibly, if he chooses to. But probably you'll be one of those types of people that can only get it out of the Word, you know, out of the Bible, but without the Spirit of God, it's just words in a book. But with the Spirit of God, the Bible becomes the Word of God. So don't get that confused. But he wasn't getting it. So today he was kind of like, you know, back in, throwing stuff at me. He was brought up some messianic Jewish guy who's been around a long time that came in after me on the Internet, you know, and he likes to push, you know, messianic things on Christians because Christians think he's wonderful. And he's, you know, one of the types of people you'd say is, no, no. You know, you wouldn't want to get involved in it because it was kind of like most of the time off the wall. 
you know, a lot of mysticism and Jewish stuff and a lot of weird stuff, you know. So anyways, he was pushing this, you know, and telling me this and telling me that. And then I said something back and he said, well, you're a really angry person. I said, really? Who told you that? Did God tell you that? Did um, my neighbor tell you that? Did somebody that's physically seeing me, like, beat the snot out of somebody? Arr, I'm going to get him. You know, or pull it. <laughs> like I got to go. Pull a gun. No. He just read the words and said, you're an angry person. Which told me where he's coming from. Because that's what God uses for discernment a lot of times. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And a lot of people post things that are about themselves. You may not know that, but, you know, ask God. He'll tell you. So I kind of went back and forth with him. You don't know, talk for a few minutes. And then finally got tired of listening to us. I said, look, if you want the truth, here's a Jewish site that's 100% guaranteed. First of all, he fall over with it, but it'd be over his head anyways. But I gave him Hebrew for Christians, you know. And, and um, John, can't remember his name. Last name. But anyways, John, and I'll remember it a little bit, but John has a site, you know, and it's right, it's right on. I mean, he deals with Christians, deals with Jews, you know, perfect. Um, I could have gave him one for Israel, but they, they, you know, one for Israel still, you know, they came out of a very legalistic Jewish messianic kind of background. Now they're pretty grace-oriented, but, you know, I recommend them, but I always take it with a grain of salt. John, I've seen over the years, Hebrew for Christians, he worked with Zola Levitt and other ministries, but he's solid. So anyways, posted that, and you know, he's, then he comes back and says, well, why do you have to be so nee about it? You know, and I'm like, well, I'm not. I said, actually, I'm kind of laughing about it, because for me, it's like a piece of cake. Two seconds on the internet, I can prove why the guys, why one guy's wrong, the other guy's right, and this is how it is. That's simple. Two seconds. Maybe three. And so, um, then I went ahead and posted today my and my daily postings of a video, and the video was from today's word for the world, which is what I'm using video today for. And so I posted it, you know, and I just normally don't watch them because I, you know, I recorded them a few years back. And uh, so I post them, you know, because they're short, they're easy to watch, and they're pretty inspiring. And, you know, every time I watch them, they're really speaking to me. <laughs> so... That's what I'm going to talk about. God speaking. I was shocked. I posted it, threw it on there, because I'd already posted it like earlier this morning, very early this morning, matter of fact, 8 o'clock. And by the time I talked to this guy, it was like 2 in the afternoon, maybe 1 in the afternoon. But um, posted it. Then I started watching, and I went, and it was talking about everything like he was talking about. And I was going, so I said, okay, Lord, I listen. I just listened and grinned. Not because I said it, but because it applies to me. Because it was a good word. It, would, it fit exactly what he needed to hear. So I posted it. You know, I had already posted it for him before I started watching it. Then I started watching it just to make sure, because in case he asked me questions about it. And I thought, you know, because I had to answer for God, because I didn't, obviously, when you watch that video, you'll know, that's not me talking. That's God talking. So I was kind of watching it, and I was laughing, because I was going, every time somebody wants to get a... Uh, Moose and a crowd together and wants to hang me or, you know, hang me by my toes, you know, beat me, beat me in my nose and make me blood and whatever, you know, there's a joke about that. But anyway, whenever they want to beat me up, you know, or crucify me, they always make it out to be like I'm some kind of angry old bitter man wandering around kind of like, you know, and I always go, um, have you ever watched any of my videos? <laughs> I said, the one thing you're going to get out of it is a chuckle because I do it a lot. And you'll probably hear me laugh, and if it's really good, I'll laugh loud. Laughing out loud was me way before the internet came about. My mother used to laugh out loud, and you could hear her in the church. And same thing with me, you can hear me laughing, and it's not the gift of laughter. But, you know, I just posted it and let it go, and I was watching it, and I just got blessed. So I said, you know, I should write that, you know, that... While you're doing your Halloweeny thing, you know, because you're really a Halloweeny, and um, you know you're trying to make everything all holy, you know, out of Halloween. Really, really, I went and watched.
Bubbles the Clown in a re recent kind of extravaganza for the holiday. And uh, took my wife to it. You know, it was kind of neat because we were in this outdoor Tuacon, 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 outdoor thing watching these dance troops, you know. And they had Bubbles the Clown as kind of like this guy that comes around and does his little monologues, you know, um, comedy reditions. You know, he wears a clown suit. But he goes, really? Talks in a girl's voice. Really? And I don't know why I said that, but it was just like, yeah, interesting sideline. But anyway, so the music thing was that I would no sooner think Bubbles the Clown was mad than I get mad. I don't get mad. I think it's funny, you know, and I just, maybe I have a weird sense of humor, but most of the things that people write or try to attack me with, I just think is goofy. It's like, dude, if you check out what I'm saying, it's true. <laughs> if you go and talk to Jesus, like I said to do, he would tell you. So, who are you arguing with, really? It ain't me. And so when I was watching the video, I was thinking, that's it ain't me, you know, and that's what I'm trying to share now. It's like, hey, it's amazing how if you let God use you, God's not going to confuse you, though you may not understand what he's doing at the time that he's doing it. But if you let him use you, you'll see that the pieces of your life and the circumstances you're in will fit perfectly for God to use to minister to another, including to yourself. That you will receive a blessing on it, even so much so that this is what Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You will be blessed by being poor. So much so it will blow your mind, you'll be rich. Really. So don't listen to Donald Trump or some other rich person. You know, or worse than that, you know, one of the biggest fallacies and Pharisees around is, you know, the rich money-making kind of schematic people that are making money off you. Um, like Mike Ramsey's, I think his name is, or some kind of Ramsey thing or whatever. I don't know what his name is, but, you know, he's got a mansion and he's got a radio program and he's got all these ways for you to make money, you know. Biblically. Scripturally. The only thing I keep going is, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the eye of a... How hard is it for a rich man to enter the, enter into the kingdom of God? Uh, it's easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle. Um, should this guy be talking about making money or should he be talking about how to get rid of money? I'd be personally talking about how to get rid of money, but nobody's listening to me anymore. They want to go listen to him and make money so that they can donate. Right. I know how that goes. Just like Halloween. Compromise. After all, isn't that what you're going to do in the next few days? Compromise? You don't have to. I don't. Now this guy, because I didn't compromise, it was a teaching on the rock. Funny, my name's Stone. I'm not much of a pebble, but I am a rock. And the things that I was talking about was how the rivers of your circumstances and the rivers of life, so to speak, come washing over you if you have your rock sitting upon the sure foundation, which is Jesus being the chief cornerstone and his teachings being really the platform of the foundation that's upon the biblical scriptural word of God. But his teachings, Jesus said, these sayings of mine, as he called them, in Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, were actually the corner posts and the pillars of your faith that is the doctrines and dogmas. Love your enemies. Bless those who despitefully use you and curse you. You know, follow after mercy and forgiveness, loving kindness, those things. Peace, love, and joy. Not attacking anyone. Not really beating up on anyone. Although every time, I, every time I write the word false, people think I'm beating up on them. I'm just telling you it's false. Warning it. Look, that's wrong. Just like if somebody was getting ready to stick their finger in the fire, say, no! No. Don't do that. You'll get burned. Oh, well. So I only got one word to say to you. I'm not beating you up on Halloween. You can do whatever you want to do. God will bless you. God will forgive you. God will let you compromise. But man, wait till those circumstances catch up with you. You kids start talking about Halloween.